Warning, this project may cause uncontrollable laughter, projectile vomiting, bleeding out of the eyes and ears, and worst of all, learning. You have been warned. Hello, learned and astonishingly attractive pupils. My name is John Green, and I want to welcome you to Crash Course World History. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on a second. Did something seem a little different? Oh yeah, my name is Mayher, and over the next 10 minutes, we'll be discussing how in a mere 300 years from 1450 to 1750... Mr. Green, Mr. Green, is, is this going to be on the test? Yeah. First of all, I'm not Mr. Green, and second of all, this test will measure whether you are an informed, productive, and engaged member of your history class. The test will discover whether you're able to think about anything other than the latest celebrity marriage, and whether you'll be able to put your life and your community in a broader context. And everything. Everything will be on it. I know, right? So pay attention. And I'm talking to you, the one sleeping in the back of the history class. Don't think I don't see you. Ah, better lighting. And check out my cool new sticker. So, when we're talking about the time period 1450 to 1750, we're going to discuss three main points. One, What's going on in the New World and the Atlantic Treaty? A new world, a dazzling place I never AKA the new kids on the block. Two, what's going on in Europe, the old homies. And three, what's going on in the rest of the world? Also known as the people who are always tagged in the Instagram picture, but are the ones taking the Instagram picture. So I know that for most of you guys, the only date you're going to remember is 1492. Though Columbus wasn't the brightest one in the bunch because he did think he landed in the East Indies, despite all evidence saying that he landed in a completely different place. That's why we're named America after Amerigo Vespucci, not, say, Columbus land. But even his inadvertent mistakes allowed Columbus to initiate what is now called the Columbian Exchange. As the name suggests, this was a widespread transfer of food, animals, and diseases, and both sides benefited. The main beneficiary was the old world. They received millet, corn, potatoes, and other such foods that allowed a higher calorie per acre food growth that caused a explosion. No, not that kind of explosion. This kind of explosion. So this population explosion was caused by settlers immigrating to the New World, which combined with religious persecution made them immigrate to new colonies that were funded by joint stock companies that allowed investors to share risks, such as the Jamestown or Virginia Company, you know, like Pocahontas, as well as chartered companies in which individuals went to the New World to look for profits. Also, the New World received traditional European animals, such as horses, which, especially in the vast Great Plains, enabled natives to have a faster alternative method of transportation. However, animals such as cattle and pigs just overran the land and decimated native crops. However, any benefits gained from this were all eclipsed by the dun 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 disease brought by the Europeans. natives of the Americas went through living hell. Their relative isolation from the Europeans caused the diseases brought by European settlers to spread like wildfire, decimating indigenous populations. Diseases such as smallpox, measles, and influenza, and they couldn't just take Tylenol to make it better. Moreover, Spanish conquistadors like Pizarro and Cortes used this disease as an advantage to help them in conquering major South American tribes like the Incas and the Aztecs. It's the of as Jared Diamond of Guns, Germs, and Steel, remember the book you pretended to read, would say, it was the superior weapons of the Europeans that enabled them to invade, conquer these major empires. As conquistadors came to the Americas, they wanted to boost their own wealth as well as explore and exploit raw materials to send back to their home country, mercantilism. Additionally, as these new Spanish invaders soon found out, native elites were willing to accept colonial government as long as they could retain some of their old privileges. And in general, natives were open 
to European missionaries coming in to disperse European culture and Christianity. As ethnic boundaries that divided the native people dissolved, this allowed a melding of European and native culture and interbreeding created a mixed society. Think of it like a food pyramid. At the top is the donuts and ice cream that you love so much but aren't too good for you. And at the bottom are the fruits and yucky vegetables that we all spit out into our napkins when our parents aren't looking. In much the same way, or maybe not similar at all, was the Latin American social hierarchy. At the top were peninsulares, or Spanish colonial officials. Then below them were Creoles, who were people born in Latin America to Spanish parents, but were still looked down on were still looked down upon by the Spanish aristocracy. Now all the cool names begin. The mestizos were a mix of European and Native American ancestry, and the mulattoes were a mix of African and European ancestry. And finally, at the bottom were the vegetables, the Native Americans that everybody hates, who are given little freedom and forced to work long hours. Now, I know those of you who do chores think that your parents are slave drivers. Yeah, not exactly. In labor systems such as encomienda, peninsulares were given a certain number of natives and land for them to work, an exchange they were required to take care of and convert these natives. As Christian missionaries such as Bartolomeu de las Casas appealed for reform, plantation owners in Latin America as well as in the south of America essentially traded natives for African slaves. Slaves were often more willing to work and had a longer lifespan that paid off in the end. However, the higher price of slaves favored large plantations and estates that required grueling labor, such as the cultivation of tobacco, cotton, rice. That's right, you can thank the Africans for that shirt that without you would be topless. And Asians for all that rice you eat every night for dinner. What? It's not racist if I'm Asian. And how did the slaves get here? Not on a luxury cruise liner like the Royal Caribbean. Probably more like that one carnival cru cruise where all the toilets started overflowing. Yikes. The Middle Passage was a one-way ticket for slaves from West Africa to get to plantations in the Caribbean colonies and the Americas. Welcome to your all-expenses-paid trip on Carna Hill. The amenities include a complimentary bucket for your ramen, as well as these stylish silver shackles that bind you to your 200 other cabin mates. All jokes aside, the Middle Passage was horrible for all the slaves on it, and 20% of those slaves died en route. Slaves were one of the main commodities on the triangular trade that linked Europe, the Americas, and Africa. Slaves went from Africa to the Americas, where they were used to produce raw materials, such as rum and sugar, presumably to get drunk and hyper, which were then sent to Europe. Europe then used these raw materials to produce manufactured goods and guns that were then sent to Africa. The economic conditions here include monopolies on trade routes given to chartered companies such as the Virginia Company, as well as mercantilism, in which colonies produced raw materials which were sent to the big mama mother country. And colonies were only allowed to trade with the mother country that then sent them manufactured materials. To protect domestic industry, mother countries placed tariffs, or taxes, on import goods, annoying the colonists. Think about it like this. If you buy all the ingredients for a cake and then send it to someone, if they make the cake and don't allow you to have even a taste, you will be enraged. Or maybe I'm the only one who takes dessert so seriously. Now, we know the world revolved around money. However, the extraction of silver from silver mines and silver became a major currency accepted all around the world, and it caused severe inflation. The use of silver also allowed Europeans to gain access to Chinese markets that were previously closed. Ni hao money. Will the racist jokes ever end? Sorry, Jeffrey and Ryan. Now it's time to go to number two. Not to worry, Gianna, it's time to move on to your people. The Whites. After the Black Death ended, the population of Europe began to move into cities, and this increased demand for products and services. And this also led to the Renaissance, which literally means rebirth. In the Renaissance, there was more literature and art, and with the help of the printing press invented by Johannes Gutenberg, 
This allowed a dissemination of books and materials that spread ideas all across Europe, and literacy began to increase. This then led into the scientific revolution. This includes important scientists such as Galileo or Copernicus. Also, this translates into the Enlightenment, which was more of a revolution in the form of ideas and human thinking. With scholasticism, the methods of the scientific revolution were used to apply to human nature. Enlightenment thinkers degrading traditional authorities such as monarchies. They decided that people should be allowed to self-rule, and if the monarch didn't protect the rights of the people, the people have the right to overthrow this oppressive government. At this time in Europe, the Catholic Church was the authority on everything. People trusted it completely and unfalteringly, and the Catholic Church and Pope had complete control over people's lives. Then along came a monk named Martin Luther. This could be the start of something new. The Catholic Church, according to him, was corrupt with sales of indulgences, which were forgiveness of sins, and they cared more about money than faith. Martin Luther proposed the groundbreaking idea that faith should be based on the Bible. It also created a new idea in Europe that people could achieve salvation without going to the church. And this was the beginning of the widespread Protestant Reformation. Luther made it acceptable to question the authority of the church. As the common masses of Europeans became better educated and more literate, they began to ask questions about the world around them and the authority of the church. In fact, the Protestant Reformation paved the way for revolutions in politics and religion and science. In response, Catholics held their own counter-reformation. In the Council of Trent, they gathered to address Catholics' position on important religious questions and doctrines. What was the result? The Catholics were able to contain the southward spread of Protestantism. And by 1600, most of Southern Europe, including Italy, Spain, Portugal, France, and Southern Germany, to be heavily Catholic, while England remained Anglican. But not for long. Along came Henry VIII, the player of history. What did King Henry decide to do? Create his own Church of England, based on Protestantism. There were many religious battles because of the Protestant Reformation. It was the Protestants or Anglicans in England versus the Catholics versus other Protestant groups like the Puritans, which led them to resettle overseas. However, this then translates into the monarchy that followed Henry VIII. First was Charles I. He signed the Petition of Right with Parliament because he desperately needed money. But he then claimed divine right and didn't call Parliament for 11 years. This caused a civil war. Parliament raised an army led by Oliver Cromwell. Once they had ousted Charles I, they placed Oliver Cromwell on top. But Oliver Cromwell also ruled with intolerance and persecution. Next came James II. Well, James II was a Catholic, and nobody likes those. James II was ousted in the Glorious Revolution, in which they put William and Mary on the throne. And in 1689, they signed the English Bill of Rights. So now England has a constitutional monarchy with limited powers. Moving on to Spain and Portugal, they were the leaders in maritime trade. Portugal and Spain had a disagreement over who would control territories in the New World. This led to the Treaty of Tordesillas, in which east was Portugal and west was Spain, and the world was divided down a line. Portugal was also gaining money from its slave trade with Africa. Prince Henry the Navigator was an important Portuguese at this time. He was able to train and develop new technology for ships and aspiring sailors. The importance of Spain grew under Charles V, who was 
from the Habsburg dynasty. In 1519, Charles was elected leader of the Holy Roman Empire. There was the Spanish Inquisition in which Spain kicked out and killed many of the Muslims in their territories. Now moving on to Le Francais, très bien. Sorry, I take Spanish. In France, Henry IV issued the Edict of Nantes. This was because there was a lot of controversy going on between French Catholics and French Protestants, the Huguenots. The Edict of Nantes allowed religious toleration so everyone could come together and be a big happy family. I love you, you love me. But then, We're under Louis XIV, he revoked the Edict of Nantes. Louis XIV was an absolutist, meaning he wanted absolute power. This then translates into the War of Spanish Succession. Other European countries were worried that Spain and France would join to become an unstoppable combo power. In the agreement reached, Philip V was allowed to govern Spain, but was never allowed to join with France. And France had to cede much of its territory to England. Allowing a more complete balance of power between all the European nations. The situation in Germany and the surrounding Slavic areas in Central Europe was more complicated than whatever is going on with Justin Bieber. The Holy Roman Empire wasn't really Rome, but included present-day Austria, Germany, and other surrounding regions. During the Protestant Reformation, Northern Germany went Lutheran, while much of Southern Germany, along with Spain and France, was Catholic. It's sort of crazy, so I'll just stay with the highlights. So first, in 1555, was the Peace of Augsburg. This allowed princes in the many eclectic German states to decide on their own religion. But then came the Thirty Years' War, from 1618 to 1648. In this, Protestant territories challenged the authority of the Holy Roman Empire, and the rest of Europe got involved. Thereafter, the Holy Roman Empire existed, but was greatly weakened in power. Well, France got most of the benefit from this. In 1480, Ivan III freed Russia from the rule of the Mongols. He established himself as Tsar. Oh, I just can't wait to be king. Then came Ivan IV. He established an absolute rule and centralized rule. He offered freedom to peasants from their feudal lords if they could help expand territory. The only catch was they were the ones doing the con conquering. Cossacks were peasant soldiers who expanded Russian territory to the east towards Siberia and to the south. However, Ivan IV wasn't called Ivan the Terrible for nothing. He ruled the horrible reign of terror. Next came the Romanov dynasty. The Romanov dynasty also ruled ruthlessly. Under this, peasant farmers, known as serfs, were essentially slaves. Russia was isolated from the West. During the Renaissance, they were under the control of the Mongols. During the Protestant Reformation, Russia never really was part of the Catholic Church. But then came Peter the Great. The main goal of Peter the Great was to westernize Russia. He made Russia's first navy and even established St. Petersburg as Russia's capital on the Baltic Sea. He wanted a warm water port to open up trade with the West. He even brought in European architects and engineers to live in Russia, specifically to westernize it. Talk about wannabe. And now it's numero tres time. Oh, wait, it's time for the open letter already? But first, let's see what's in the secret compartment. Oh, teleportation, one of the many benefits of editing software. And now, let's see what's in the secret compartment. <laughs> And it's a crayon. And it's a crayon in the color flesh. You know, I've never understood why this is considered flesh when while Europe was fighting and fighting and also fighting, it was places like China that developed gunpowder and the Ottoman Empire that conquered Constantinople and the Mughals in India who built the Taj Mahal. Oh, and you know Gutenberg who invented the printing press? Yeah, the Koreans had woodblock printing centuries earlier. But the white people had a somewhat good moment with the scientific revolution, so let's not be too hard on them. And now, an open letter to the Ming Dynasty of China. Dear Ming Dynasty, 
Aside from having a name that furthers racist stereotypes, you were also one of the only times that China was ruled by foreign outsiders. Unless you are the Mongols. <laughs> by the way, over the next 40 weeks, you will frequently hear generalizations followed by, unless you are the Mongols. <laughs> wanted to segregate the ethnically Chinese. But being the ruling class and only 3% of the population didn't work out too well. Unless you are the Mongols. At this point, even emperors with cool names such as Kangxi and Qianlong weren't interested in much other than China. And that's why trade and contact to the outside world was limited to the European trading port at the Canton Station, which annoyed the Europeans because they could see all the trading opportunities in China. Think of it like a little sibling, trying to get into an older sibling's room. But China is annoyed because it's always trying to do its work, and Europe is annoying it, and if you could just close the door when he came in and... Wait, what were we talking about again? That's all for today. Don't forget to be awesome, and see you next time. Crash Course is produced by me and my sneezing rabbit. Okay, what is that? She said, whatever, major loser. Whatever, major loser.